This week, it's a brand new massive volcano on Mars. Pascal Lee joins us with the deets. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 102, recorded on March 15th, 2024. A new volcano on Mars. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Rocket Money. Did you know that nearly 75% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about? And that includes me. When I started using Rocket Money, I couldn't believe how many subscriptions I was paying for each month. Between streaming services, fitness apps, and delivery services, it just never ends. But thanks to Rocket Money, I'm no longer wasting money on the ones I forgot about. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. And when they see monitors your spending, it gives you reports on your spending habits and patterns, which, uh, well, I'll freely admit I've been kind of miserable at tracking myself. So it's really wonderful to let somebody else do it. And I have to say, the way in which they present them to you is incredibly appealing and easy to use, even for me, Mr. ADHD. I can see all my subscriptions in one place. If I see something I don't want, Rocket Money can help me cancel it with just a few taps. They'll even deal with customer service for you, and God knows that's something I don't want to do. Rocket Money has more than 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million, that's half a billion, in canceled subscriptions, saving its members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash twists. That's rocketmoney.com slash twists rocketmoney.com slash twists. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of This Week in Space, the Indiana Jones of Mars edition. I'm Rod <laughs> Pyle, the editor-in-chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and I'm back from Ecuador in my favorite place with my favorite person, Tarek Malik, well, sort of, editor-in-chief sort of. of space.com. <laughs> well, because, because, Tarek, we're joined today once again by the indefatigable Dr. Pascal Lee, our favorite Martian explorer. Oh, hello, Pascal. hello, hello, Pascal. Welcome back. Good to be here. Thank you. Also, welcome back, Rod. I thought you'd have more of a tan after being in Ecuador. Oh, my uh, God. No, like I looked weeks. like a beekeeper the whole time I was there. I was completely <clears throat> swathed in cloth and slathered down in sunscreen because I was warned, and it's true, the equatorial sun is a little on the more uh, direct side. And the only place I forgot to use sunscreen was the tops of my feet. And I think I've peeled off the six layer of skin now. Oh, my so gosh. Oh, my gosh. But yeah, did you hug a Galapagos turtle while you were there? Tortoise? Tortoise. Tur um, tortoise? <laughs> no, you're not allowed to do that. And they assign you a guide. So I had a personal guide the whole time I was there. So you're either with a personal guide or a group. But I did see a couple of tortoises hugging each other. Oh, that's Which is so something sweet. they do to make baby tortoises. And it's very very slow I, I i was hearing barry white in my mind you know? <laughs> um, anyway probably more than you need to know but yeah the galapagos is really cool um not you know it wouldn't be my prime choice for a tropical destination because i've been to a lot of nice tropical islands but in terms of the fauna it's incredible yeah and uh yeah. i think pascal would enjoy it because he's kind of an inveterate explorer i will simply add that i ended my trip with a tour of the ecuadorian navy which doesn't take long because it's it's six frigate sized they're called corvettes but six little frigate sized ships but i'd never been on a navy ship before so we got piped aboard so we're walking up this gangplank and i hear this Wee! and i'm thinking oh that sounds like a star trek episode wait is that for us <laughs> i realized we were being piped aboard and these captains are standing at attention i'm looking around like what is is there a general here oh that's for us okay oh nice it was, nice. Yeah, it was fun so i could see uh the appeal all right but yes. but before we start please audience don't forget to do us a solid make sure to like subscribe and so forth mm -hmm. because and so forth you, you know what i'm gonna say we we need you all right let's get to a space joke here's the first one is from loyal listener simon don't have a last name all the Hi, way simon switzerland so yeah say hello to switzerland because that's further what orbits this hey Tarek. Yes, Rod. Sorry, I'm out of practice. What orbits <laughs> the sun and tells jokes all day? I don't know, Rod. A cometian. 
Oh, oh, rim oh shot. I get it. A I rim get shot it. is kind of kind for that one. <laughs> I had to think okay. about it, but it's like Comet instead of comedy. Waka uh, waka. <laughs> wa- wa- okay, here's here's another one. Uh, this one's from me. Uh, you got to think back like being a, a child in the 1950s like me, and this will make more sense. So think of all those horrible old black and white sci-fi movies. A mama Martian lands in Brooklyn, sees the jungle of television antennas atop the tenements, and cries an alarm. You kids get right down off that roof. I, antennas, you know? Antennas oh, 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 okay, okay. See, I, I knew you were too young. Uh, all right. <laughs> Pascal got it. Barely. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> Yeah, so Pascal, it reminds me, of, it reminds me of that moment. I just have to bring it up one more time because I I can't tease Tarek about falling out of his chair anymore because he fixed it. I did not. It's that, still on blocks. I haven't unpacked <laughs> parts yet. <laughs> but that moment of the Arctic when Pascal's sitting at the head of the table where all the lonely explorers sit and spend their evening chatting with each other. And I'm unveiling my very special made just for him, Ernest Shackleton flag. And I was about to do the big moment. I'm saying, because you and I, I know we share a love of the great golden age of exploration and Ernest Shackleton. And I'm just about to pull this thing out of the bag. And he goes, Rod, I'm not that big a fan of Shackleton. (laughs) Um, Okay. Well, anyway, here's your flag. Let's move on to something else. All right. So speaking of moving on to something else, let's do a headline. Starship. So oh, I'm just going to gonna pull the I'm, yeah I'm going to pull the the rope starter on you because I know you've got the whole thing. What I have here in in the uh, notes is blah blah Elon blah blah Rudd blah 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 <laughs> almost block boom blah blah. Yeah, not not wrong there, but it was a really big flight. Um, no, that, that that's probably like the biggest story of the week. You know, this week you picked a good week to come back, Rod, because SpaceX. Uh, uh, launched their third ever test flight uh, of the Starship and Super Heavy launch system. Now, uh, for folks who may not recall, this is the world's biggest and most powerful rocket. It's like 400 feet tall or something or thereabouts. And SpaceX has been launching them out of their Starbase facility in you know South Texas at the Boca Chica Beach. Thing it's very awesome. I encourage if you're ever in the area, please you know swing by. Uh, you can get super close to the rocket. Uh, but this was like their big swing. They officially reached, they keep saying they reached orbit, but they reached mm. orbital speed, right? right? And there's a difference because if they reached orbit, they could have done nothing and it would have just circled the planet for like an entire time. But really the trajectory they launched on uh, this flight on was aimed at the Indian Ocean. So it was always going to auger in at the or, end. Or as or as their commentator called it, the Indiana Ocean, which yes, there was I that. just about fell out of my chair on that one. There was that. But um, but not, you know, not to, not to not to, you know, dim, was it dimin- not to diminish the feats that happened. Right. Uh, this actually happened as we're recording this. It happened on March 14th. So it was yesterday. So it's very, very fresh. Um, and SpaceX, you know, we we sent our reporter down. Uh, days before they even had approval. They only announced that they got approval from the FAA the evening before the launch, which right. is crazy. Um, well, was it their announcement or the FAA's announcement? Well, the late. FAA announced it first, I think at like at four mm. in the afternoon, five in the afternoon, something like that. Well, they do uh, take their time, don't they? Yeah, well, they do need to get faster. And there's a whole OIG reporter, a, a, a special <coughs> report about how the FAA has to get faster on these things. Um, but so SpaceX launched the rocket. We knew that they could because they've launched it twice before. Uh, this time they, they they went higher and faster, just like Gordo Cooper, you know, in the, and, uh, in the Mercury flights uh, than ever before. They had a, a clean, hot fire. Fire stage separation. We've got a video, I think, of it. If um, um, if we haven't showed it yet, uh, of that that last ten seconds, and um, uh, and it's just amazing to see this massive, massive rocket, uh, which is you know taller than the the Empire State Building. Um, there we go. Least, yeah, here, here's a video actually of reentry, uh, which was another amazing fact. So they had a clean separation. They reached this orbital speed. A clean hot stage. A clean hot stage separation. Yeah. Uh, and then the Starship vehicle SN twenty. I think they call it Ship Twenty Eight. Uh, they they had a Starlink internet connection with the rocket through the bulk of of its flight. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't seamless. There there were dropouts. Yeah. Um, but what we're seeing here is its actual kind of reentry approach on the way down. And what was really really interesting, if we if we do want to uh, zip ahead, we can. Um, but you see the heating from that that uh, uh, 
Uh, oh, look that, at that. Yeah, you can see, see it. You can see it hit a- wow. atmospheric interface and it just gets super hot and plasma. It's absolutely gorgeous. All of it uh, in, in real time as it happened. Uh, and I think this is a, a definite win because they can see how the heat shield is working in action. They can see that plasma sheath that forms around it. You know, we've only seen, you know, fits and starts of this, like uh, the plasma through the window of a Soyuz or a, uh, a NASA space shuttle. So these are just truly unprecedented views. So are we now, looking nose down or tail down here? It's we are looking, down, right? we are looking, uh, I believe this is uh, towards uh, the tail. Yeah. Towards yeah. It's towards the tail because it, these are, this is a camera on the forward ac- uh, actuators okay. uh, I looking think down the towards the tail actuators. So what, what I read, I was preparing a press release yesterday and had about 14 people <clears> wagon <throat> with corrections and ideas, which is always fun. Look at oh, that. yeah, I see. It's tail down. <laughs> yeah. but I guess because it was rolling, they couldn't do their uh, their uh, their second. Yeah, their and that, right? that's, that's the part. There were there were anomalies on the flight. The 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 ship itself was rolling a bit, and because it was rolling uh, while it was in in uh, in space, they they opted to not do a Raptor fire relight. So that's a uh, that's the engine that they're going to need to you know relight when they're in in space to do their maneuvers and whatnot. Uh, and this is just absolutely amazing. This, it's this really view. something. <laughs> isn't yeah. that isn't that awesome? Stainless wow. steel rocket. Like coming back to Earth. Um, and so they skipped that. Now, they, they did successfully demonstrate the Pez dispenser-like payload bay so that they can kind of eject Starlink satellites en masse. So would you say they demonstrated they opened it, but they didn't eject anything, right? No, they didn't eject. They just they, they, they demonstrated they could open it, is what I'm trying okay. to say. Uh, they did perform an in, in-vehicle in propellant transfer test. It's not clear how successful that was, but they were actually they actually were able to get that uh, get through that stage itself, and we're waiting for a little bit more detail on that. But it sounds like it went pretty much as expected um but they did lose control of this vehicle on the way down and so it did burn up in earth's atmosphere over the indian ocean after re-entry um and uh, and the same thing happened to the super heavy booster uh which uh shortly after its launch uh it did you know it separated it actually did a boost back burn this is a massive massive rocket uh and it it re-entered the earth's atmosphere and then they lost it something like 500 meters above the ocean in the gulf of mexico like it it, oh. it it broke apart but they got almost back to the ground so uh i think in terms of like a test flight you could focus on yeah they lost the vehicles but they were going to lose the vehicles anyway they were going right. to toss them into the ocean and they they got so much farther uh, on this flight than even on the second test flight where they reached space for the first time. Uh, I think it's a really big uh, a coup for them. Now, as we've mentioned before, and I know this kind of headline is a, a bit longer uh, than I'll than, say, uh, I know, right? SpaceX has a, a, a long way to go, right? They have to, they have to launch, I think maybe up to six or seven more of these this year is what Elon Musk said. Uh, they have to launch o- over a dozen just for one Artemis moon landing flight. And they have to demonstrate a lot of refueling techniques, like like robust ship-to-ship docking, uh, that sort of thing uh, for the future. So there's still a lot of open questions, but the rate, like if they can get through this, um, uh, this flight, get through the FAA kind of investigation part of it, because the FAA is uh, leading an investigation that SpaceX is over. The FAA is overseeing an investigation that SpaceX is leading, which is weird. Um, well, they have to get through that, make whatever fixes, and then they're going to, you know, try again, I suppose. So and we haven't okay. talked about life support. You know, that's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, we got to talk about that, too. Oh, uh, we'll just we'll, we'll put in a backpack from the dragon. Everything will be fine. So, Pascal, <laughs> um, part of what we're going to talk about today, I hope, is is landing zones. But as long as we're talking about Starship, any any thoughts on this in terms of the great Martian future? No, this was a really good account. The only thing I could say is that it's actually normal for the FAA to ask the the craft manufacturer to conduct its investigation mm-hmm. and then to that to uh, rubber stamp, so to speak, or you know, yeah. come in afterwards to, to understand what went on and and agree that the fix was was a good fix. Yeah, and and that's that, that's, you're right. That 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 is not a new thing because all of the investigations have been led by SpaceX and then they identify all the corrective actions right. and they say exactly. do it. So, uh, so we'll see, we'll see. Hopefully though, the approval process for these flights gets a bit f- faster and a bit clearer because it's a lot of, uh, from an editorial standpoint, it's a lot of travel expense money to invest into sending someone out there if you don't know if they're going to launch or not. So yep. something a little bit more than a few hours before launch would be great. <laughs> so. were, were those heat shield tiles that were being shed as well? It's very possible that there, we, what we saw during the flight, and I don't think we have video of this because it was like an hour and a half long flight, is um, 
is you did see a lot of debris pop free from the right. vehicle. They could have been tiles themselves. <clears throat> they could have been something else because they looked very wispy, almost like um, like the 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 what is it? The tel um, not the the the. The, those covers that they used to put on the thrusters rod for right. the shuttles that was it Tyvek it's almost like Isn't they had that Tyvek kind of or Nomex or something yeah yeah it, it had like that kind of consistency guards. we could see it uh during the flight there was also uh, a lot of what looked like venting from the ship vehicle in space and it wasn't clear if that was actual reaction control system uh firings or if it was a planned roll maneuver or if it was something else you know as part of like a test so we're hoping to get a little more clarification in the future um but uh, uh these you know these ships pascal they make a lot of them like right uh, and it, it it's clear that they're they're trying to do the 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 bare bone vehicle to ch perform those test objectives to get to what they want um you know because i would expect during uh, uh during uh, uh like the actual crude ones they're going to be a lot more like like soup to nuts locked down for that sort of thing so. all right well let's go to a break because we have a lot to talk about and uh we will be right back go nowhere okay so moving on to our main story and it's a big one and pascal as far as i know we're the first non-print venue to be well first non-print or non-text venue to be talking about this is that right yeah that's true i mean aside from the talk we gave at uh, the conference yes well that's that's for a special crowd so for the public <laughs> big yes. cheer for everybody all hail the great explorer of mars who has found i know this is embarrassing you that's why i enjoy it <laughs> who has found a volcano a big whacking volcano that's been sitting in plain sight since at least 1971 when mariner nine was imaging the planet and it was sitting there looking at earth looking at mariner nine saying hey i'm here i'm a great big volcano and somehow nobody managed to see it until you caught it one afternoon it's just <laughs> astonishing so if you may if you would rather please walk us through the process of how the hell you discover a new volcano on mars that's not yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. This is something uh, we reported this week, the discovery of a giant volcano on Mars. And I did that with uh, a graduate student, uh, Surab Shubham. He's a third year grad student in the Department of Geology at the University of Maryland. I'm on the West Coast, he's in Maryland. Uh, but we've been collaborating for quite a while in the study of this area, uh, mainly because at first, this is the place that we had proposed uh, as far back as 2015 uh, as a possible human landing site. And so I don't know if I can show some pictures here. All right. So here's where we are on Mars. Uh, on the far left, you see the Tharsis bulge. It's a big region that rises above average Mars. And, it, and on it, there are three uh, well-known giant volcanoes that are riding on it. Ascaris Mons, Pavanus Mons, Arcia Mons. And then as you head towards the east, you have this maze of fractures called Noctis Labyrinthus, of which the volcano is part. But at the time, it was just Noctis Labyrinthus for the whole thing. And then farther east, you have, of course, the Grand Canyon of Mars, but you know, a thousand times larger, <laughs> hundred times deeper. Uh, well, actually, no, 10 times deeper, uh, Valles Marineris. And, 10 times deeper than the Grand Canyon on that's Earth. That's right. Correct. That's yeah. right. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, right there at the boundary between Noctis Labyrinthus and Valles Marineris, you have a bit of a mess, uh, lots of fractures. Um, you don't immediately see a volcano, but you do see that there's some sort of a circular structure there. And that actually, as it turns out, is the giant volcano. And the red outline is the farthest extent that we can see of the volcano. So uh, it, I'll show you the next slide. I mean, this is not a formal talk, but just to, yeah. to point out some features here, the, the diameter, the total diameter is a thing of is 450 kilometers. So that's 280 miles. It rises to over 9,000 meters. So it's higher than Mount Everest, wow. uh, above average Mars. Uh, the whole region is high, though. So this is probably why 
one of the reasons why it was missed is because the rest of the region is is at around 8,000 or less meters. But this is a good kilometer above the rest of the hump on which all this rides. And it's deeply eroded. And so you don't have this nice cone shape uh, uh, form that you that other volcanoes normally have. And then as part of the announcement, but really this is what we were looking at in the first place before we saw the volcano is that there's a sheet of buried ice huh. right there as it turns out now within the perimeter of the volcano uh, but uh, it's a sheet of buried ice and so i just want to show you this a little bit more closely so you know the story of our interest in this place starts with that little yellow dot in with surrounded by red the noctis okay, so, landing excuse me but, so, but a lot of people are just listening to audio yeah, so what we're so, looking at now is a close-up of this volcano and off to the right by yeah about 100 okay, kilometers so, is a little yellow dot which is where your glacier is right exactly so what we're seeing is the perimeter of the volcano 450 kilometers across that's the bigger circle uh and there's a little red dot within that perimeter which is in a relatively low elevation region of, of this broader region. And this little red dot is where we had proposed back in 2015 already that humans one day really should land because this region strategically is super interesting for, for long-term human exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, by being there, if you head east to the right, uh, you head into the Grand Canyons of Valles Marineris, and that is going to give you a chance to look for signs of ancient life in all the rock layers of the canyon. If you drive west, you climb onto the Tharsis Plateau where all these giant volcanoes sit. And this is, again, before we found our little volcano. And then you have access to the volcanoes, which might still be active today, their caves, and now you have the best possible place, we think, to find life that's still alive today on Mars. So you drive east, look for ancient life. You drive west, you look for modern life. And so... And, and I, I think, Pascal, sorry, sorry for interrupting, but it seems like that's the crux of all of this. I mean, you found the remnants of a giant volcano, just for people who are, who are wondering how big 280 miles is. That's a distance from like Los Angeles to Las Vegas. That's how wide this thing is uh that, that you found but the that i guess that that was the, the big question i wanted to ask is what does it mean for that search for life you've got this yeah this giant thing it sounds as if uh it, it there's a lot of implications uh in, in so, both the search for water with this glacier and the search for life with the i guess the the heat that you would get the residual heat yeah. Okay. So volcano. this is this is winding up for the swing for the fences. Before we get this answer, we need to go to a break. This will <laughs> okay. keep everybody on the edge of their chairs. Uh, Tarek, don't fall out of yours. And we will be right back. Don't go anywhere for the big the big reveal. All right. So Pascal, you know the question, <laughs> and this is something that a lot of us are going to be clutching our pearls about. What might we find if there's thermal energy there? Here's the thing. Right now, we realize that this landing site we had proposed is within the confines of a giant, very ancient volcano, but that might still be active today. Because last year, we found a glacier uh, that is still probably containing ice, the remains of a glacier right at that spot as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's because we were studying the glacier and its surroundings that we sort of started looking around a little more closely and realize that we were inside an ancient, decrepit volcano. But here's the implication for, for the search for life that you were bringing up. This is a volcano that has been active for a very long time. So this is an area that has had heating, a source of heat from the early days of Mars, because we think this dates back to about three and a half to 3.8 billion years when it started as a volcano, wow. all the way to, to, to the recent times, because this glacier that we see, or the remains of the glacier, is actually protected by volcanic ash. And so the volcanic, the glacier has to be young. There's hardly any impact craters on it on top of that. But the volcanic blanket of, it's not lava, it's pyroclastic. So, you know, scoria, pumice, ash, 
the blanket of volcanic material thin that's covering this glacier has to be super recent. And so this volcano, we think, is still active, probably not very frequently uh, erupting, but still active. On top of that, that's a little dark lava flow right next to the glacier, which is further evidence that this place has been erupting recently as well. Because over time, these lava flows on Mars turn orange and oxidize and disappear in the landscape. This little lava flow is still very crisp. So here you have a source of heat that has been on and off active in this region for something like three and a half to almost four billion years. <laughs> and, and there's ice. There is ice sitting there. What we're seeing that, and that we're calling a glacier ice, a ice glacier is probably the latest glaciation remnant. But there must have been other former uh, glaciations throughout the history of this site. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, glaciers are made like water ice of, I mean, like, like they're made of water, H2O. <laughs> so in the context of a volcano, the ice can melt. You have liquid water. You have an environment basically that combines heat and water for four and a half billion years almost. So and, we're well, super I, excited about that. Yeah. 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 I guess, I guess the, the follow up question that I had, maybe, maybe it's two there, but we know on earth that these types of glaciers, like, like this, this, um, this one that you've, you've, you found signs of both the relic glacier from before. And now this, um, this new one, um, you know, they, 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 they created things like Yosemite. It's absolutely gorgeous. You know, <laughs> they, they, yeah. they, they, they carve the mountains. And as I'm looking at the map uh, of where this giant volcano is in this Noctis Labyrinthus, which is filled with all of these canyons. I mean, are, are these canyons that you think were, were formed by the glaciers? And then the other question, and this might be a little more top of mind, because you hint at like the potential for actual activity now or relatively, you know, re recent activity from the volcano. What does that mean? Is it like magma underneath the, the, the ground? Is it bubbling out? You know, that, that, that kind of a thing that we could find from orbit. What, what would we want to look for to see yeah, if it's so truly active? I'll answer your second question first. There has to be a magma chamber still under this volcano. Mm -hmm. It's probably petering, petering out a bit. Uh, you know, volcanism is not as intense today as it was in the past of Mars. Uh, this, whether this place could still erupt or not, we really don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were even some little hot spots uh, here and there at this location still, although we haven't found any. In fact, we've been looking for hot spots from across Mars for quite a while now, and nothing jumps at you. Which, however, brings us to your other question, which is how does this tie into the rest of the canyons around? Uh, the, there are two big theories about how the Noctis Labyrinthus narrow, boxy canyons form. One is that it's just tectonics. So the crust of Mars got fractured when the whole region got lifted up, pushed up from beneath, from the, from the hot plume of mantle material pushing up underneath the crust of Mars in that region. So the crust basically cracked open. And as it cracked open, giant chunks of the surface collapsed downwards. And that's why you have these, these, uh, these canyons. But the alternate theory, which has often been disfavored, but which I think is the only one that makes sense and uh, is also consistent with why this volcano is so eroded the way it is. That alternate theory is that this crust of, of Mars that you see here in this region is actually full of ice. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a lot of ancient ice trapped underneath it because a lot of these lava flows that we see are actually not lava flows. They are pyroclastic deposits. They are deposits of ash. So when volcanic ash comes and settles down onto ice, it doesn't necessarily make the ice melt away. And if anything, it preserves the ice. It's going to preserve it from vaporizing, from sublimating, from melting. And However, when you do have eruptions taking place, like hot lava coming up with this from this magma chamber under our volcano or even in a broader region, rising to the surface, it's going to melt the ice along all these crack lines where the lava is coming up from. And once the ice disappears, well, you've lost the backbone, if you will, that's holding up all these, all these, all this plateau material, and so it collapses. Mm -hmm. So we think that. What we're seeing here when you look at Noctis Labyrinthus is not so much the result of uh, you know, tectonic 
collapse as much as melting of ice collapse or vaporizing of melt of ice collapse uh, so the volcano itself you really cannot explain its shape by just tectonics yeah so at the very least when it comes to the volcano itself we think that the reason why it's all chewed up as it is now is because it actually was a wedding cake of ash <laughs> a few lavas and mostly ice ice from glaciers glaciations the volcano itself puts out a lot of water which then condenses onto the surface into an ice cover uh, we see that in antarctica today still so and then when it's when it gets heated from underneath <clears throat> giant chunks giant chunks of this volcano basically collapse because the ice goes away and there's no more strength to it and so that's why we think this thing looks so so beat up so where you have volcanoes and magma and collapses and all that kind of stuff you have heat and where you have heat and possibly protected areas like lava tubes and caves and caverns and so forth you might have you might have like critters well, oh yes you <laughs> might have life and we'd oh, like yeah. to well, find critters and critters we, the we, aliens from the 1980s uh, horror uh, sci-fi we, movies <laughs> we've got a rover driving around taking samples of what is probably incredibly sterilized soil that's been sitting out in uh, the sun spewing radiation for the last however many billion years but here you might have something a little different to explore well you know we're not exactly sure in what form we would find life uh to me the most important quest is to actually look for life that might still be alive today and so mm -hmm. uh if you you know if you go into the canyons and you find an ancient rock layer with life in it okay great but fundamentally you you still don't know if it's alien life it, it could have right. been life that was started on earth got exported to mars by you know like we have meteorites from mars ourselves and 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 so mars could have been seeded by earth life and so therefore finding life on Mars in fossil form, you, you couldn't tell. Is it Earth life that got exported to Mars or is it really life that started on its own on Mars? Because fossilized DNA doesn't tell you anything, right? That's right. You, you cannot do genetics on fossil life. I mean, even if it looks weird as a critter, that, that's not a sure sign that it's alien. I mean, look at how diverse life on Earth is. So, uh, well, however... Dark, yeah. <laughs> Whoa! Oh. Whoa! <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Wow! Okay. I just want to talk about Mars, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to impugn myself, but I thought, okay, sorry, Pascal, go ahead. Just, just no, I mean that—that that was a fun line. But if you, <laughs> if you, uh, if you're really intent on finding something that you could, at the same time, determine whether it's alien or not, you want to find it alive. Because that's the only way you can do genetics on it and biochemistry. You want to see if it uses the same amino acids as life on Earth. You want to see if it uses DNA or something that at least has DNA structure. I mean, if you can tie it, if you can really show that it, it really comes from an independent branch of life as opposed to all Earth life, which is related genetically and uses the same amino acids for their proteins, uh, then you have really found alien life. So, so this whole business of looking for life on Mars we we don't say it enough i think we're looking for alien life on mars because that's that's the big question right if you if you find an alien form of life on mars then you can say okay life is common in the universe if it's just earth life exported you're, you're not really further down the road on that on that question so by being at a volcanic site that might still be active today with ice that might still be preserved from the latest eruption which is and this ice is sandwiched between volcanic flows older ones and this recent blanket of ash you have in my view a real good chance of finding a uh, life that might still be alive on mars and then do genetics on it and then figuring out if you found alien life uh you know as much as i was attracted to going to this place even before we found a volcano there uh now that it's right there at our landing site <laughs> i mean you know, we we went there so that we could drive to the volcano, but the volcano basically drove itself to us mm. here. Uh, you, you you have a super exciting place to explore. And then the other thing is, let's say you're not even interested in the search for life, but you just want to understand the the geologic evolution of Mars. If you go, if you went to any of these other giant, beautiful, you know, much less eroded volcanoes, all you have access to is their outer layers. 
right. the latest lava flows. You, you don't have access to the inside of the volcano. I mean, even if, you, even if you go into a cave, these caves are right at the surface of the volcano. They're not, you know, all the way down into the inside. And so, okay, well, excuse me, but before we erupt onto our next question, sorry, Pascal, but we got to go to yeah. another break. It'll okay. only take a moment. Go nowhere. Okay, so Tark to you, buddy. Yeah, so so Pascal, this is amazing, and I'm you know the it's clear you have a passion for this place, Noctis Landing, as a as a landing site uh, uh, for uh, for future exploration, especially now with this this giant volcano. I'm I'm curious, given how tantalizing you have made not just this volcano, but volcanoes on Mars in general, right? You you pointed out the Tharsis chain of giant volcanoes. We know that Olympus Mons is the biggest volcano in yep. the solar system and, uh, and of course, on Mars as well. And I am wondering, you know, since we've had images of this region in particular since Mariner 9 in 1971, since we've, we've been looking at these, these volcanoes of Mars, um, you know, since we started imaging Mars, you know, way back when. Uh, why we haven't landed there yet, right? I mean, like the 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 the, the Mars rovers, uh, Spirit and Opportunity landed in Meridian Planum and Goose of Crater, um, and uh, and where is uh, Perseverance now? Is that uh, is that is that's not Jezero? Jezero is Curiosity, yeah. right? So Perseverance no, is that the other one? No, Jezero is Perseverance. Jezero is yeah, it is Curiosity. Perseverance. It, it, there we go. There we go. <laughs> because that's places what, like this scare curious. engineers is 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 my contention. Oh, but I mean, it just well, I just, yeah. I mean, the difficult, main reason why. Pascal, is it difficult to land at this place? Yeah. Like how much more so, is it than say where we've seen the other ones go before? It would have been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why the most spectacular country on Mars, the Canyon lands and the volcano lands have not been explored by landers yet is because when it comes to the Canyon lands, the landing error ellipse, the uncertainty that you have on your landing spot was too big in the past. And so we couldn't really pinpoint a landing uh, spot on Mars. And so if you're aiming for the canyons, you might end up at the top of the canyons as, a, as opposed to the bottom or somewhere or on a way. slope. Where it's, you're, right. you're, you're, it's too risky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the volcanoes were off limits too because they're too high in altitude. And so to land on Mars, as you know, you have to, there's a whole sequence of things that have to happen for you to, for, to slow down. For the parachutes, too high in altitude right. for the parachutes. Oh, Not okay. enough time for the parachutes to slow you down and for the retro rockets to take over. So you would slam into the surface if you land too high. Mm -hmm. The human landing site we picked uh, is is there because in 2015, when NASA had this historic workshop for people to propose human landing sites, the constraints that we were given was thou shall not land above two kilometers of altitude, mm -hmm. but below that, thou is okay. <laughs> okay, well, this place where that dot on our map is, where we propose to land humans, is actually well below two kilometers is that it's at about 1.2 uh, kilometers of elevation. You could land there and you could land there today now with a robotic spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my current mission in life is to try to, to get our next exploring mission to Mars, not a sample return, but an exploring mission to Mars to go to this location. Because I think that JPL would have the, the tech, the know-how to do a pinpoint landing on Mars uh, I mean, it's still a pretty broad area that you could target. Yeah. So, right. okay. but you could you could really get to that spot and then it, you know drive into the volcano, which is they they do dare uh, mighty things there. I've heard, oh right? Lord. So, so, yeah. but but it's interesting you bring this up because I mean you've been to landing uh, site selection conferences, a number of them, I'm sure. I, I went to one basically, but it was so from a journalist, you know, dispassionate third person journalist standpoint, it was so interesting. So I think there was probably 80 people in the room. Leonard David was there too, uh, Tark, but there's probably 80 people in that room. So there's the engineers who say, give me a nice flat basaltic plane with nothing on it to land, to land my Rover in this, at this point, I don't know what the landing ellipse is three or four kilometers or something, maybe 10. Yeah. And then the geologists over the saying, no, give us something interesting, you know, give us some strata or something we can go look at because sitting on a flat basaltic plane gives us nothing. The bio biologists, exobiologists, if you have any, are saying, well, can you give us somewhere where we might be able to find anything and so on. So to watch these, 
these different forces. It's like watching an oscilloscope with a little point in the middle. For those of you Tarek's age, yeah. the oscilloscope was a CRT display. That had I, that I know what at. oscilloscopes are. We used yeah, to experiment with the them. Outer limits. Right. <laughs> so you see this point moving off the, the center on these different vectors. And it's like, well, all these forces are pulling in different directions. So what you're you're talking from a geologist and to some extent exobiologist standpoint of look this place is interesting we've known it's interesting since mariner nine and you know this is our big chance to probably go arguably to the most interesting place anywhere on mars yeah and of course it uh, it it cannot be coming just from me because obviously i'm too close to this to have an objective opinion. Okay, we'll that. support you. That'll swing <laughs> but, it. That'll swing it over the over the border. Okay. Here, here's the thing about landing site selection. I, I actually have not attended any uh, Mars robotic mission landing site meetings. Right. I was because, talk, I was including the human landing site one, but yeah. Yeah. Because because I think that when it comes to robotic missions, there was a phase where going anywhere on Mars is is all good. And we had so much to learn about the planet, surface chemistry, its surface conditions. Uh, you know, landing safely somewhere, even somewhat boring scientifically, was okay because you could still learn a lot about Mars. Right. But at this point, I think that, you know, to, to really make a robotic mission worthy, it, it obviously should go to a place that's scientifically compelling, but also it should really pave the way for humans. I mean, that's, you know, I tend to think, think long term and strategy. And to me, what has been really exciting is to look at where we would mm -hmm. set up a base for humans. I mean, I'm not big personally on, you know, settlement and colonizing Mars. That's, uh, I, you know, I tend to think of Mars as future, at least for quite a while, as a bit like Antarctica, where mm -hmm. we might have a research base. But if we were to set up, like, say, a, you know, a US led international base at the surface of Mars, where would that be? And the reason why we would do that is because that's the best thing to do for long-term Mars exploration. You want a, you want an infrastructure on site, and then from there you fan out to all the corners of Mars you like with local vehicles. Uh, that's how we are so strong in Antarctica. We have a base somewhere that's not particularly exciting, although it's, it is exciting. McMurdo is near a volcano, et cetera. But you really have the base and then all the aircraft and the mobility systems to get you around. So. So to me, strategically, as a scientist, I, I really, it's not one or two missions to Mars that's going to find life necessarily or, or really give you, get to the bottom of all these questions we have about the geology. You really have to set up shop there and explore long term. And so where would you do that? And uh, that is why I've been so obsessed by <laughs> getting us to volcano country and canyon country, because that's where you have the richest record of stuff happening on mars uh and and so this is like you said uh, rod it's it's just a gift it's a <laughs> my my first my first reaction when i realized with surab that we were inside a giant volcano wasn't you know what implication it would have for mars's history which of course is sort of the underlying question but which is wow there's nowhere else. There was. There's no, really nowhere else we can possibly want to go now and set up a base. Uh, if if you know if if we if we didn't do it here. So uh, let's just go back for a second, if you don't mind, about the hiding in plain sight thing, because of course the 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 popular media has been picking up on that like crazy, and every other headline is it's been there all the time, <laughs> which I think. You know, uh, from from my viewpoint as a media guy, this is a real gift to Pascal because it's not it's not being portrayed as just another. Oh, they found you know another small mountain on Mars. How exciting! Yawn. It's it's fun, you know. And they're the 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 press, and I'm guilty of this too. We're sort of grooving on the fact that it was there. And it's like, you know, a dinosaur bone sticking out of, of the of your driveway and nobody saw it until you did, right? So can you talk or a little who, bit more? You, or you that king, of, that king they found in a parking lot, right? Isn't that the, the, yeah, the means yeah, of the yeah. king? So. But, you know, th this is a big feature and I get that it's eroded and really beaten up. And so you have to kind of... You know, if so for my my 27 inch screen right now, if I roll back about six feet in the room and squint my eyes, it's like, oh, oh, look, it's a circle. 
But, you know, and, and you told me earlier before we, we got on the air that you, you know, I had assumed that while I was watching you spend hours and hours and hours and hours <laughs> going over orbital Mars photographs up on Devon, that you were looking for this and you correct me and said, Nah, it was an afternoon, which is even a better story in a sense. So can you kind of walk us through that part? Well, you know, to be fair, this thing, as big as it is, does not look like other volcanoes on Mars of that size. Uh, the, you know, things that are big volcanoes on Mars look pretty well preserved compared to this. And and so, you you know, your, when your eye gets trained uh, to look for things that, you know, you, you mm. become familiar with. Right. Uh, if you were looking for a giant volcano, you would look for something that looks like what's a, what's known as a giant volcano, and you, you wouldn't see this as a giant volcano. Uh, this, on the other hand, is to to be fair as well, is is you know almost welded and seamlessly connected to a fracture zone that is you know volcanic in original material, but where we don't see immediate volcanoes, not this size uh, as well. And and so it's also blurred, if you will, you know, by being connected to Noctis Labyrinthus to the west. Right. And then there's actually a big chunk of this volcano that's entirely missing. I mean, it's not like you even have remnants that are recognizable. That's the eastern part of this giant circle. Uh, that is all gone. Uh, mm. You wrote it away. And that's the part that connects to Valles Marineris. So now you're distracted by Valles Marineris starting. So it's interesting uh, you mentioned that because looking at this at this shot we've had up you, one kind of wonders okay so is this draining into and part of the formation for Valles Marineris or is it moving the other way can you sort of walk us through that yeah <clears throat> Valles Marineris has a has a long complicated history but it's probably and I agree with that a fundamentally a, a tectonic giant crack in the crust of Mars in the mm -hmm. first place so you yeah. start with fractured um weakened terrain uh but then i think another thing that happened in valles marineris is that at different times it was filled with ice and water and one of the most underestimated uh agents of shaping the surface of mars and its history is ice we don't see ice a lot anymore because it's not stable at the surface when the atmosphere is so thin but there must have been times in the past of mars uh, where the atmosphere was somewhat thicker and thick enough to allow snow to linger and ice to form and glaciers to do their work. Uh, I actually don't really subscribe to the early Mars being wet and warm, uh, you know, general theory, because I think uh, Mars has never really had a balmy, warm climate with oceans slushing around. I, I, I don't see that at all. Uh, a lot of the analogs that have been attributed to liquid water flowing at the surface of Mars. We, we find analogs for that in the Arctic, on Devon Island, for example. And they, they form also those types of features under completely glacial conditions. So, uh, you know, making Mars warm early in its history is actually very difficult to do from even an astronomical evolution standpoint. The sun at the time was 25% dimmer than it is today. And meanwhile, Mars was as far from the sun as, as it is today. So. Uh, it's it's a super challenge for climate modelers to to come up with this early Mars that was wet and warm that everybody talks about. And uh, but meanwhile, we see signs of glacial erosion uh, all across Mars, including along Valles Marineris, the, the giant canyon. A lot of these little tributary valleys that you see were not carved by water, liquid water, but probably by glaciers. Can, can I so ask I, real quick, Pascal? Just yeah. um, just because of what you've been describing, what it, what it's like, what it looks like, and and whatnot, uh, is is really you know sparking an image in my mind. I'm trying to understand if I was here at this landing site for this volcano, yeah. If I would even know just from looking around that I'm standing on a volcano, you know, or a giant volcano. Because I think about uh, Yellowstone, uh, for example, which we know is a a, a super volcano, you know, in uh, uh, in the U.S. Um, but you know, when I was there as a kid, it, it didn't look anything like, like what you would expect a, a, a super volcano caldera to, to look like. I mean, would I, would astronauts even recognize from their surroundings, they were on one there or, or just because it is so different than say, you know, Tharsis or, or whatnot in terms of the formation or, or would it just look like 
more Mars, you know, with some hills in the background like we've seen yeah. from the no. rovers in themselves. You you would know that you are in a volcanic setting. Mm-hmm. And here's why. When you land there, obviously you will find scattered blocks of volcanic rocks. But we see that in most places on Mars. And you never know if the rocks really come from here or whether they were tossed over here by uh, some remote impact somewhere else on Mars. So, I mean, you know, as you pick up a rock, it's volcanic, but it could be from a very distant location. It's ejecta, meteorite impact ejecta from somewhere else. But by landing here, you will quickly <clears throat> run into bedrock, like rock that hasn't traveled. It was not thrown out by some remote impact. It's from here. And that bedrock is volcanic. We can see the, I mean, that lava flow, for example, that very dark lava flow right next to the glacier, that is volcanic rock. Uh, you would you would therefore know that there's got to be a source for this lava somewhere. And obviously, by going to Mars and landing here, you would have been trained in the hypothesis that this could be a giant volcano. And you would start looking around. And I think in the in the road cuts of the cliffs that are exposed here, you would see the volcanic layers very well. You would see the lava flows. You might even see some lava tubes exposed along the cliffs, which are hard to tell from here because we're looking, you know, straight down into this landscape. We don't see lava skylights, lava tube entrances on the preserved surfaces of the volcano here, but you could see hanging lava tube entrances along the cliffs. Uh, that and would be spectacular. And that's where we look for the eight-legged thoats, I think. Or were they six? <laughs> I can't remember. Um, six. They okay, were six. <laughs> so, thank you. So we're into the lightning round here because we're, we're coming up on the hour. So my two remaining questions, actually there's three. Um, next steps for publishing, getting scholarly reaction, pushbacks, uh, bruised egos in the community, whatever. You know, what happens next? And then, of course, uh, are we going to be able to name this region Pascal's Peak, which is my pick? <laughs> we we haven't had pushback uh, from our reporting of the glacier last year. We haven't I haven't had pushback in, in spite of how how fast the news of this uh, giant volcano has gone around. Mm. I, I have not received any pushback from that's incredible from colleagues and peers. That that's that doesn't validate necessarily what we're rep- what we're hypothesizing here, but right. we are working on a peer reviewed publication. That we're trying to submit on a fast track, uh, and you know that will spell out the you know what we think we're looking at here, uh, and then the hope as well is that will be followed up by other people looking into all these areas with their own expertises, you know, volcanologists which I'm not, uh, tectonicists, which I'm not, <laughs> uh, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, you know, and ultimately I wouldn't be surprised if this was a real contender. I mean, there are some things that are working against going there. Uh, it's pretty high altitude still. Uh, we, for example, what would be ideal in my little world is if we could fly a helicopter, a JPL mm. beefier helicopter around, because that's really the way to explore this place is to fly around it. And, land and collect samples or examine things up close uh and it's pretty high to fly a helicopter and even if we could fly a helicopter how much payload could it carry okay we're really in thin air here at at these altitudes uh but it's still the lowest altitude giant volcano we could possibly explore (laughs) on mars right so well, you ever heard it? You heard it here, folks. Pile picks Pascal's Peak for the for the naming for this place. So. No, no. In fact, we we submitted a name that's pretty uh, mundane, uh, Noctis Mons, in you know celebration of Noctis Labyrinthus right next door, which means the mountain of the night. Noctis Labyrinthus means the labyrinth. That's, that- that's pretty cool. But I was really hoping that you named after dear departed King Kong. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the former dog. <laughs> you know. Things might get named afterwards of, you know, like specific features like a Mesa, you know, why not name one of these peaks, the King Kong peak? Well, I was I'm thinking okay. piles okay pits for a, for a lava pit. <laughs> Do you buy that? Piles. Yeah. Piles pits. <laughs> piles, 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 <laughs> piles bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Tarek's enjoying this because he's getting revenge without even having to work for it. All right. Well. 
on that, <laughs> do you have anything you'd like to add, sir? I'm just very grateful for, uh, for having a chance to discuss this. Uh, uh, it was a team effort between me and uh, Surab, but also other people we've consulted along the way. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very grateful for all the data. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we came here yeah. with all these data sets ready for us to use, made public with uh, beautiful tools like uh, ASU's Mars Quick Map and NASA Ames's uh, and JPL's NASA, uh, Mars Trek. Uh, not to mention Google Mars, which actually was helpful too. Mm. Uh, we have all these tools ready for us to use, and uh, it, it, it's it's really riding on the shoulders of a lot of hard work from a lot of people. So, well, I know that that the the ever present John Scott also helped you with the uh, with the, the glacier. glacier yeah, so yeah, he's the yeah he has been the chief field guide of ANZMET, the the search for meteorites in Antarctica for so many years, and uh, still is 30, thirty four, yeah. right? 35 now. Yeah, exactly. Jeez. And so That's a lot uh, of time. <clears throat> he actually has a glacier named after him in Antarctica. Uh, but on Mars, we don't name things after people who are still alive. So there's a price to pay to get something named for you. Oh, no. Jeez. Here, here I was just hoping for a, tardi a fat tardigrade. Well, <laughs> I want to thank everybody and especially you, Pascal, for joining us for episode 102. Is that right? Yeah, it's 102, right? I think so. Yeah, Mark, I think still, so. Still awake? Okay, good. Uh, of this still awake. Space, Always awake. For the streaming premiere, I'll, I'll case it that way, of Dr. Lee's new discovery of a massive volcano on Mars, giant volcano on Mars, which is going to be the name of my new anime series. Um, this has really been cool. So, Pascal, take a bow. We all uh, doff our hats to you. This is really a wonderful moment and something that you've deserved for a long time. For the more mundane what? among us, Please don't forget to check out space.com, the websites and the name, and the National Space Society NSS, at nss.org. Both are good places to satisfy your space flight cravings. And I will add, there's a great story about this reveal in on space.com by Leonard David. And in the next issue of Ad Aster Magazine, which you should all be reading, uh, Dr. Lee will, will have a story on, uh, on this, this discovery, which... Pascal, I'm waiting for. So uh, speaking to Pascal, where's the best place for us to track your exciting exploration and discoveries as we move ahead from their angry red planet? Uh, publications, probably. Uh, I, I give talks. I have a YouTube channel where I share stuff that's exciting. Uh, Twitter, Twitter. That's where I mm. share most of my news. It's pretty much the only social media that I, medium that I use, Twitter and LinkedIn. Also, so, yeah, feel free to connect, ads. and I'm happy to to share all the news. X. <laughs> That's yeah, right. The, X someday now. we'll stop calling it Twitter, <laughs> even though X is ridiculous. And Tarek, where can we find you no longer falling out of your gaming chair? <laughs> well, as always, you can find me at uh, space.com, tracking whatever is new in space. Not a lot of launches planned for this weekend, so I'm looking forward to hopefully some rest and relaxation. And if you're looking for a fun video about the link about Pluto and Cerberus, you can find that at my YouTube channel, Spacetron Plays. Uh, that was a lot of fun uh, to put together. Uh, so wait, hope... wait, wait. This is your this is your vi your Twitch video channel, right? Yes, yes. And no putting... Twitter, no YouTube, YouTube. I don't have Twitch, so <laughs> I don't stream. Oh, well, but, I mean, but this is your gaming channel, and you're putting stuff about Pluto on there. Yeah, because there's a character called Cerberus in the new Battle Pass in oh, Fortnite. Well, how could I not so we're gonna, know that? So we're gonna to play if video you games all had day listened to the last episode where I told I everyone did. that I was gonna play about I it. I did, <laughs> but I I was laughing so hard by the time you got to that point, I couldn't remember what it was. All right. And of course, you can find me at pilebooks.com or at astromagazine.com. Don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. That's T W I S at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, ideas, and insults. Uh, as long as you aim them at, at, at uh, Tarek, not me. Man, uh, I'm new just, episodes. I'm just punching bag today. <laughs> well, I'm back. I've been holding this in for two weeks. How can I help myself? I love you, dear. Um, new episodes published every Friday on your favorite podcatcher. So make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. We'll we'll take whatever format you you want to give us as long as it's five stars or golden globes or golf clubs or whatever. Also, don't forget you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad free on Club Twit, as well as some extras are only available here for just $7 a month, or I think it's two ninety nine per show. You've heard Leo talk about this. We want to keep bringing you the best shows we can, and to do that, we need your help. So think of it 
as NPR or public television, we're bringing you the best stuff. I mean, look at today. Look at today. We had the big Mars Explorer himself here. You can't get that for seven bucks anywhere else. So, um, yeah, jump in, step up, be counted. You can also follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter, X, and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week.